God says, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. So the whole concept is, is to train up your children and discipline them so when they come to the place of age, there's nothing that they can't do. The mercy of God is released every time in the Bible when people are fasting. We become a team. We become a body of believers. If you get a breakthrough, she gets a breakthrough. I'll loose the gifts of healing where no cancerous cells shall ever be in my body. I loose the gifts of healing that drive out diabetes and any, any foreign sickness. exalt him lift those hands and just begin to magnify his holy name come on the presence of the Lord is in this house today the angels of the Lord are encamped in this place today come on just begin to exalt him and magnify him come on bless him from the depths of your heart here today come on let's begin to make praise declarations today come on the kings in the house today the Lord of Lords is in the house today Come on, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Come on, he's here today. Praise him, exalt him, magnify him. Lift up his holy name today. Come on, as you begin to praise him, shackles and chains are beginning to be broken off. Mountains and barriers are going to begin to come down. Victories are beginning to be won as you begin to exalt him. Come on, declare his name. Declare his glory. He's mighty. He's awesome. He's powerful here today. Oh, worthy are you, Lord God, today. Worthy are you, Lord God, today. Hallelujah to your great name. Now, come on. Begin to thunderously applaud him. Thunderously exalt him. Thunderously glorify him today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, send shockwaves into hell today. Amen. Come on today. Let God arise. Every enemy be scattered in Jesus' mighty name today. Hallelujah. Discouragement is being broken off. Heaviness, weariness is being broken off. In Jesus' mighty name, the presence of the Lord invading this place for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many believe that here today? Amen. I want you to join hands one with another here today. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say in the name of Jesus, I bless you today. May God's hand be upon you. May the will of the Lord be accomplished in your life. May you hear his voice. May you be led by his spirit. May he release dreams and visions that would give you direction and guidance all the days of your life. May you be encouraged. May you be uplifted. May you be edified in the name of the Lord. I loose an anointing for you to walk in victory, for you to overcome, 
for you to prevail, for you to succeed all the days of your life. May you be strong in your body. May sickness and disease have no place in you. May you receive strength, stamina, and endurance for the glory of God. I lose God's wisdom. I lose God's knowledge. I lose God's understanding to be upon you in Jesus' name for God's glory. I declare over your life the blessings of the Lord are resting upon you that everything you touch, it's going to prosper. You're living in abundance and more than enough in Jesus' mighty name. Do you believe that today? Let's give God a big praise. Now I want us right now, I want us to begin to pray for our nation. The Father, in Jesus' name, we bless our nation today. And Lord, first of all, we come. And Lord, we repent of our sins. Lord, we have sinned. We have rebelled. We've committed abominations in this land. And God, we cry out for mercy. We deserve judgment. We deserve wrath. But God, we're interceding and crying out for the mercy and the grace of God upon America. And Lord, I pray today, God, that you would begin to move by your spirit all across this nation. I pray the convicting powers of the Holy Spirit would cover this land, that people would begin to repent and lament and turn back to you in Jesus' mighty name. God, I ask you to move upon the heart of our president, upon the heart of those that serve in the Congress and the Senate. Lord, those that serve in the Supreme Court and the appellate court systems. God, I pray pray that you would deal with them. May they understand, Lord, that one day they must give an account of their lives to you. God, I pray in Jesus' mighty name, a transformation in America. I pray revival would begin to break out in every city across this nation. May it be spontaneous combustion. May the glory of the Lord cover this land in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we cry out for America to be saved, America to come back back to God in Jesus mighty name for the glory of the Lord now lift your hands to the Lord I want you to pray this prayer with me say father in Jesus name I receive an anointing a mighty anointing to be a soul winner to be an ambassador to be a witness for you I declare today 2015 shall be my most productive year by leading people to you. Put words in my mouth that I would speak as your oracle. As I lay these hands upon the sick, may the sick recover. As I lay them upon those that are possessed, may they be delivered. In Jesus' name, I declare signs, wonders, miracles shall follow me this year. The anointing is stronger now than it's ever been. In Jesus' mighty name. Do you believe that? Let's give the Lord a big praise. Come on, let's really give him a big praise. In Jesus. Come on, let's really bless the Lord here just a moment. Amen. Come on, I sense a victory here today. I sense a breaking off of the old and a release of the new coming your way for the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. I want you to do something here today. I want you to just symbolically, I want you to symbolically just do like this. Just like you're taking off something old and now you're putting on something new, amen? The new anointing, the new power, the new glory that's coming up on your life like you've never walked in before. It's clothing you right now in Jesus' mighty name. Say, it's on me. I'm walking in it in Jesus' name. I'm not the same. There's something different about me. It's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Won't you turn around, smile at someone real big. Ushers, if you would, come again to pass out the communion. God bless you as you come. Worship the name of Jesus, Jesus. I'm not ashamed to shout out the name of the Lord. I'm not ashamed to worship the name of Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. 
Hallelujah. How many of you recognize the presence of the Lord here today? Let me ask that again. Do you recognize his presence today? In Luke 24, there were a couple of disciples. It was three mornings after the crucifixion. It was the third day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were walking on a road to Emmaus and a man appeared with them. And as they traveled, they rehearsed everything that they'd been through over the course of the last three days. They shared their troubles. They shared their fears. That everything they had put their hope and trust in, everything that they had expressed confidence in and given their very lives for was in a very, very dark moment. Their Lord had been crucified. Their Lord had been buried. And they were fearful of what the future holds. And the scripture says in Luke 24 that this man began to share with them and said, don't you remember the words of the prophets? Don't you remember the words of the one that you served who said that they could take down this temple, but in three days I would raise it up again? How many of you recognize the Lord today? And the Bible says that they sat down, they, they walked all day long, and they got to the evening time, and they sat down. And it was time to eat. And they invited this stranger on the journey with them to sit down. And the Bible says that the stranger with them that they did not recognize sat to eat with them and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And when he took that bread, he blessed it and he broke it. The scripture says in Luke 24 verse 30, while he was at the table with them and he took the bread and blessed it, he broke the bread and gave it to them. And verse 31 says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Here we are in a new year. We're embarking on a new journey. And some of us can praise God for what 14 held. And some of us uh, can look back on 14 and say, well, it wasn't all that bright. It was pretty dark. But I've come to tell us this morning, in the breaking of the bread, we can recognize him just like they recognized him when he broke the bread and gave it to them. Listen, has your day been dark? Has your promise seemed to be far away from you? I've got good gospel news for somebody today in this moment of communion as we break the bread as we bless the bread and recognize him our eyes can be open let me tell you you're about to see Jesus in the midst of the darkness like you've never seen Jesus before and it's about to get brighter and brighter and brighter in Jesus name do you recognize him today somebody shout I recognize him just like he did so many times when he took five loaves and two fish he lifted it to the Lord, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it. Just like he did with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He took it, and he blessed it. He broke it, and he gave it. So we take it. We bless it. We break it today and we say, Lord, we are ready to see you show up in the midst of dark times, in the midst of embattled times. Lord, we ask you to let your light shine before the world through us, that the world through you might be saved. Lift your bread to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I recognize you today. It's been hard to see you at times, but right now my eyes are being opened. Revelation knowledge is opening to me. I'm going to see your word and understand your word in a way I've never experienced it before. I'm going to see you in the midst of my life even when I didn't recognize you. That's you in the middle of it working all things together for my good. And I praise you today. Lift that bread. We recognize you, Jesus. Open our eyes, we pray. In your name, let's take of the bread and drink of the cup. Somebody give God a great big 2015 shout of praise today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, my name is Diana Brooks Bank. I was homeless for two years. Last April, God gave me my Jesus home. And um, my daughter I haven't seen in nine years. I got to see her last year. So praise God. That was a real miracle through fasting. Thank you, honey. Yes. Yes. Um, we felt, oh, Debbie Houston. 
we felt like God was uh, changing our life or redirecting us. So we get, began to pray and fast. My son had learning disabilities and a lot of problems like that. And we have been trying to get him in a specialized school for years. We fasted. Not only did he get in the school, we also got a brand new house, which I had had a dream. I saw the house. God brought me to the house. He also moved me out here to J-Town, which I felt like was a, a word of the Lord. So each and everything that we have, oh, and my mother-in-law released the inheritance so we could buy the house that the bigger and the better house. Yeah. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. My name is Angie Smith, and I've been with this church for quite a few years. And Pastor Bob been encouraged us to fast one year. And I didn't know if I could do it, but I did. And I made a big, long list of things. But the main thing that I got and received, I got everything on the list. But I got to see my dad, and I hadn't seen him for about 15 years. But I, I fasted for three days. That's as long as I could go. My head felt like it was going to pop off. And I still got everything on my list. So I want to encourage you all. Amen. You weren't supposed to tell that part. Hallelujah. I did the best I could. My name is Maxine Henderson, and I'm here, standing here as a true believer and thanking God that my grandson has had Down syndrome, and he didn't talk until he just turned five, and he is in the first grade, and he go to church here with Pastor King. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great miracle? Uh, my name is Christy Crenshaw, and every year God does something miraculous for us. Um, one year he delivered me from smoking in one day. It was all done one day, a service here. Um, another year he healed my son of learning disabilities, and last year he brought my husband's father back into his life. He hadn't seen him in 20 years. Isn't that a great miracle? Amen. My name is Adelaide Abney. Uh, the first time last year I fasted, I was taken off almost all of my blood all of my blood pressure medicine, healed of diabetes, and then off of another medicine. I also was in a bad car accident, the, the fifth car, and I lived, and they just couldn't figure out why I had no, I only had two or three bruises. That was wonderful, and also survived a surgery, and the doctor said you should have been dead. I don't know what happened. So God was definitely good last year. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Twenty-five years we have fasted and prayed uh, during this time. It all started back when I became the pastor of the church, and our church had, uh, my dad had passed away right at a time when the bonding company that had financed our church went broke. And it was a real difficult time for our church, and I didn't know what to do, and I I felt like God spoke to me to fast for seven days and he would speak to me. So I fasted seven days and he spoke to me. He said, fast another seven days and I'll speak to you. So I fasted another seven days, 14 days, and God said, now I want you to fast seven more days and I'm going to speak to you. And I fasted another seven days and God said, I'm going to deliver the church from this oppression and I'm going to release great miracles in the church. And so we begin to establish a time of fasting, and we would take the first three days of each month, the first uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we would fast. And so what would happen is we'd have hundreds and hundreds of people pledged to fast, and then by Wednesday, if we had a handful of people fasting, it was a miracle. So we established a miracle service. I said, we're going to have a miracle service, and my miracle that I was believing for was to have at least 100 people that fasted to, till that miracle service. We had it at Prayer Mountain, and when I arrived there at Prayer Mountain for that miracle service on a Wednesday, I couldn't find a place to park. And uh, I walked up to the lodge, and people were standing outside, and I said, well, it's about time to begin. Maybe we should go in. They said, Pastor, we can't find any room inside. 
so when we went inside, um, it was standing room only. And uh, I shared just very simply, and then I said, I want to pray for those who need a miracle. And I, I began to pray. One man had cancer, was given just days to live. He hadn't eaten in almost a month. He was a big man, tall man. And uh, after prayer, he uh, sat there for a little bit and then turned to his wife and said, Honey, we need to go home. She said, Well, the service isn't over. He said, I don't care. He said, We need to go home now. So what's wrong? He said, I'm so hungry, I feel like I could eat a horse. This man went home and he ate and slept, ate and slept, ate and slept. In eight days, he went back to work. God healed him of cancer. I think we ought to give the Lord a praise clap. There was a lady who belonged to the First Baptist Church and uh, she had come from another town. She had heard about this miracle service and she came and uh, she uh, had a growth on her leg as big as a grapefruit. I'm not talking about as big as an orange, but this was huge. And we prayed for her. She went home, and her neighbor said, well, where's your been? Oh, well, uh, Evangel was having this miracle service, and they'd been fasting for three days. And I went up there to have my leg prayed for, and she reached over to touch this growth, and it was gone. She pulled her pants leg up, and there was an indentation where that growth had been. So she drove back up to Prayer Mountain. I hadn't left yet. And she came and told me the story, how she rejoiced. That year, 32 people got healed of cancer in our church. Come on, I think we ought to give the praise to the Lord. <clears throat> and so the next year, we began to fast the 21 days. And... At the conclusion, we were going to have a miracle service. And the miracle service fell on Super Bowl Sunday. And people said, there will be no one that comes to the church. They're all watching the game. Well, that night, when we got to the church, the church was so packed. There was every seat was taken up in the balcony all across the floor. We had to put extra chairs out. And we began to realize that we had a hold of something that was miraculous. In those days, no one fasted 21 days. And I would go to meetings and I would be criticized. I was told I was legalistic. I was told all kind of things. We were cultish, getting people to fast. But God began to do things in our church that was miraculous. I want you to look at our church today. We have 10 locations. We have 35 services. God has allowed us to feed over 7 million people. We now have eight television stations, including a TV station in Bethlehem. It's the only television station that has ever been established in Bethlehem. God has helped us to go forth. We have a cemetery. We can take you from the cradle to the grave. God has enabled us to reach out and touch our city in a way that a larger congregation that would have more money couldn't afford to do. Now, all I'm saying is it's the Lord. And there's certain miracles that are going to happen to you this year, if you'll fast, that won't happen to you if you don't fast. Now, I've had people say, well, I'm not going to fast during this time. I'm going to go on a separate fast uh, later, and I'm going to fast for 40 days. Well, how many know that's all a cop-out and that never happens? But when you fast with us, when you fast with me, uh, it is a greater fast than if you fast by yourself. And the reason is, is because I get your anointing, you get my anointing. We become a family. And if someone over here gets a breakthrough and God gives them a new job, and you're praying for a new job, God will give that job to you too. One year we had a man who fasted that God would heal him of diabetes. 
he had diabetes, his uh, father had diabetes, his sister had diabetes, and when he got healed on the 18th day, every member of his family got healed, and 20-some people in our church got healed of diabetes. Come on, I think we ought to give the glory to the Lord. Are you saying Pastor Bob is fasting the answer to everything? No, Jesus is the answer to everything. But fasting puts you in a place to be blessed in a way that you would never be blessed before. There's a separate blessing that comes on fasting, the Bible says in Matthew 6, that does not come on prayer alone, nor on giving alone. The three duties of every believer is to give, to pray, and to fast. Can you hear an For your best gift to the ministry, Dr. Rogers would like to help you in your time of fasting and prayer with his best-selling book, America, Fasting for Revival, and the all-new Prayer Force Report. Plus, call now with your best gift. We will include the 21-Day Fast Journal. These ministry materials are available now from Bob Rogers Ministries when you call 1-888-613-6080 or visit bobrogersministries.org. The loss of a loved one can be quite overwhelming, and many times details are overlooked or even forgotten. That's why here at Crosswater Gardens, we're offering a free, no obligation estate planning guide. This is a vital first step in keeping the wishes of your loved one in mind. And if you need help, one of our trained staff would love to speak with you and even walk you through the process. Because here at Crosswater Gardens, your legacy matters to us. Experience the worship, be changed by the ministry, and feel the presence of God. Don't miss any of the special fasting services at Evangel this January. For more information, visit worldprayercenter.org or like us on Facebook. If you don't have a Bible, hold your hand up to the Lord. But I want everyone to make this declaration with me. Say, this is the Word of God. This is God's plan for my life. It's a light into my pathway. It's a lamp into my feet. This is my road map. This year, as I read the Word of God, God will speak to me. Every promise in this book belongs to me and my children and my grandchildren. Whatever the devil says is a lie, and God will do the opposite. Because I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do, and I can be what it says I can be. In Jesus' name. As you remain standing, please turn with me to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in verse 28. Joel 2.28. Would you say that, please? Joel 2.28. <clears throat> Many believe the prophet Joel will, was actually the son of the widow woman who gave the cake to Elijah. Uh, Jewish theologians, they claim that he was the boy who grew and became a great prophet. And here in the, the 28th verse, it says, And it will come to pass afterwards that I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your own men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And that word is timnerah, which means mushroom-shaped clouds or atomic clouds. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. As you remain standing, please turn with me now to the book of Acts. 
Acts chapter 2, beginning in the 16th verse, it says, And this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to say that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And in verse 19, And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath. In verse 20, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. The difference in these scriptures as he quoted it, it was Joel that said before the terrible day of the Lord because he saw the judgments that were coming upon the earth. But Peter said before the notable or the awesome day of the Lord because he saw what would happen for God's people that where the devil would bring defeat, Jesus would bring victory. And it was a sign the Lord's return was at hand. And then I want you to look with me over in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 and in the 29th verse, Matthew 24, 29. And Jesus talks about events that will take place before he returns. And in verse 29, immediately... After the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Father, anoint your word with great power, in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen, and you may be seated. God bless you. Pastors all over this nation are preaching today on the great events that are going to take place in 2015. They want to give some type of word that will encourage people uh, for this coming year. What I want to share today is why you should fast 21 days in 2015. And if you have made plans not to fast or you don't want to participate, I want you to put your mind in neutral just for a moment because I want to share with you a few things. The Bible talks about the four blood moons. The four blood moons is an amazing um, phenomena because if you go to the NASA website and they go back to 1999 BC, 2000 years before Christ, and they project to the year 3000, that's a thousand years from now, about solar eclipses. They say there will be 12,000 64 lunar eclipse that and of that 3,479 will be total eclipse but a phenomena that takes place is what is called a lunar terad or there are four lunar eclipse in a row now that is something you can just see out of 3,500 total eclipses then to have four in a row would be a phenomena that would take place over 5,000 years. But when it would happen on a Jewish feast day, on the Passover or on Feast of Tabernacles, which are two of the, some of the most important feast days in the Jewish calendar, for that to happen, even one of these to take place, is a mathematical statistic of one times a hundred times a hundred times a hundred in 100 million days. Or in other words, it's a number that doesn't even exist. But it is so unbelievable that it would happen even one time. But yet, we are now in the midst of our eighth blood moon that has taken place on a Jewish feast day since the time of Christ. Over the next blood moon that would take place on a Jewish feast day is 600 years from now. So Jesus gave this, that the moon would turn to blood or there would be a lunar eclipse. It would happen on these Jewish feast days. And he gave this as one of the great prophetic events that would take place just before he came back. So this is a major signal. It's a major signal that we're living in the very end of the last days. 
So to give you an idea of what we're talking about, on April the 15th, this past year, there was a lunar eclipse, and then it was on the Passover. Then on April the 4th, there will be another eclipse this coming year that will take place on the Passover. And then on October the 8th of this past year, on the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a lunar eclipse, and the next one will be September 28th of 2015. At the end of January is the halfway mark, the halfway mark of this four blood moons. So we're right in the middle of it. And Jesus said that when these, you see these tribulations happen, now what is tribulations? These ca catastrophes that are happening upon the world. You look what's happened in the Ukraine. There have been 4,000 Russian soldiers killed. There have been over a thousand uh, that have been um, of the Ukrainians that have died. You look at the Ebola outbreak. There have been 4,500 that have died in that. In the Palestinian and Israeli war that took place for 50 days this past summer, there were 2,100 Palestinians that died, including 500 children and 64 Israelis. The ISIS and Boko Haram, which is down in Nigeria, have almost had equal amounts of killings. The ISIS have killed 10,700, and most of those Christians and some crucified on crosses, even children crucified, nailed to pieces of wood. The Boko Haram has killed 10,000, 340 have been destroyed by them. And then the plane crashes. It's, this is a phenomena, and it's happening in just one part of the world, which is a dominant, strong Muslim area of the world. There was the flight Malaysian Air 370, 227 people disappeared. There was the Malaysian Flight 17 shot down by the, by the Russians, 298 were killed. And then the Air Asia coming into Kuala Lumpur. It uh, crashed this week, 162 people destroyed. Then you're seeing the lawlessness here in America, a rise in anti-Semitism, a rise of racism, anti-police, uh, I mean, it almost wants to put our country back into the wild, wild west. And we're living, and we've now just reached the halfway point. And so we talk about this year. And to even make this a little more complicated, this is the year of the Shemitah. If you'll read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verse 1, it talks about the year of the release. And it was a seven-year cycle. Every seven years, there would be a release of debt. If you people owed you money, that would be forgiven if they were Jewish. If you had land, you'd kind of backed off. You didn't plow the land. You just sat back. You let God begin to speak to you. The synagogues became packed with people, and it was a spiritual reset button. But if a person did not honor the Shemitah, if they did not participate in this, it was almost like a curse came on them. And our country has so been uh, intertwined with Israel. And one of the reasons God allowed America to be created was to help birth the nation of Israel. And when our country began to turn back on God, on this seven-year cycle of the year of the Shemitah, something happened to our country. We began to have major major recessions. And as you go back, even to the Great Depression, it happened on a Shemitah year. Over the past 40 years, the greatest times of recession that have occurred where property values have dropped, where the stock market has dropped, has happened on this seven-year cycle. It happened in 73, it happened in 80, it happened in 87, it happened in 2001 with 9-11. 
Seven years later, it happened in 2008, where the stock market on one day plunged greater than it had ever plunged before. Seven, seven, seven point seven points. And now this is the year of the Shemitah again. So what are we looking at? Well, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian economist or not. People are saying this is the year the dollar is going to die. There's going to be a catastrophe that takes place, they're saying. You're talking about people who have their PhDs in economy, and uh, they study these things. They're saying, we have reached a cycle, and this may be the end of the leadership of the United States in the world economically. I don't know what's going to happen, but God does, and God is revealing in his word these patterns to us. And we have to be like the Berean church who studied the word of God to get direction on what to do. You say, Pastor, I've never been so encouraged in all my life as I've come here on this Sunday morning. Well, let me just share a few other things. If, you, if Jesus is getting ready to come back, then in position is the Antichrist. The demons of hell are all activated. I've never seen so much uh, violence worldwide in all my life. When I see Americans beheaded, and I see children being nailed to telephone poles because they're Christians by the ISIS, I tell you, something stirs within me. What would cause people to do this? In Syria, there have been over... Uh, 5,500 killed this past year and 1.2 million that have been replaced and displaced. There's been over 3 million when you begin to add the last four or five years that have had to flee for their lives in Syria alone. And now ISIS is beginning to take over that country. And their next objective will be Damascus. And I'm going to tell you, Israel's not going to put up with this. The prophecy says in the book of Isaiah chapter 18, verse 1, Damascus will be destroyed and it will become rubble and the sheep will graze there. I tell you, we're coming to a place where all of those prophecies can be fulfilled. Now, if the Antichrist is in position and if the Lord's coming back, the Antichrist is, he's probably a graduate of Harvard University in, in economics or some Ivy League school. He, uh, he's in position. And when you read in the book of Revelations chapter six, it talks about the rise of the Antichrist and it talks about how this last world government will come in the form of four horsemen. The first is a white horse. The white horse, he has a bow which shows there is authority, there is power, and a crown which shows that he conquers by diplomacy. And this is what is happening in the world today. We're being all set up for a one world government, for a one world currency. It's all in place. You have the G20 meetings that come together where they're inter uh, tailing their economy. You go down to South America in Panama. Have you ever, do you have any Pan American uh, currency? No, you don't because they don't have any. They use the American dollar. Ecuador has done away with its currency. It uses the American dollar. Country after country is doing away with their currency and it's all a part of the end time plan. And so the white horse, it shows a world government a, a government that comes together. Then there's a red horse, which shows violence and death and murder. And we're seeing this take place. It's interesting, when 9-11 took place, every one of those terrorists on those planes, they put upon their head a red bandana. They wrapped it around their head as a sign of jihad, as a sign of death to the Christian and to the Jew. And then there came a black horse. The black horse is symbolic of famine, of economic collapse. And could it be that that black horse will manifest itself 
in 2015. Many believe it will. And then there came a pale horse. Say a pale horse. Who's ever seen a pale horse? Actually, if you have a Catholic Bible, it says a green horse. And green is the color of Islam. Every Islamic nation, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Jordan, all of these countries, Saudi Arabia, they have green as the dominant color in their flag. It's the color of Islam. If you go down to River Road, there's a mosque down there. At night, it's lit with green lights. It is the color of Islam and shows the rise of the Islamic um, agenda to take over the world. And so we're living right in the midst of all this. We're seeing it right before our eyes. And many times it's kind of hard to swallow that that really is this generation. But it is. So you say, Pastor, what should we do? Well, this is one of the reasons we're fasting. We're fasting because in every situation where there has been, been uh, the time of God's destruction, upon a land. God has always taken care of his people. When the flood came, Noah and his family were high and dry and they were eating T-bone steaks. Hallelujah. I know they came in two by two and the clean animals seven by seven, but I just have a feeling that God sent a couple extra steers in there just to take care of Noah. And then uh, in the time when the destruction came to the city of Jerusalem, Jesus prophesied that the day would come when there would not be a stone unturned upon the temple mount. They laughed at him. And he says, when, the, when you see the hills surrounded, he said, flee to the mountains, for your redemption is in the mountains. So in 70 AD, General Titus and the Roman legions, they surrounded they surrounded Jerusalem, and it was during the time of Passover. There were Jews that came from all over the world. They had come from Greece. They had come from Turkey. They had come from Syria. There were over a million Jews in the city of Jerusalem. And now the Roman legions had surrounded them. And the Christians remembered that God said the city would be destroyed, and they were to flee. But how could they flee? The city was surrounded. And so God sent a message, and that message came to General Titus. It was from Rome that there was insurrection in Rome, and they were to bring their troops to Caesarea to possibly come back to Rome to help defend the capital. And so he withdrew his troops, and then word came when they got into Caesarea that everything had been resolved, and they were go back and capture Jerusalem. But while they were gone, the Christians, they said, it's time for us to flee. Jesus said the time had come. The rest of the Jews said, no, God's given us victory over the Romans. They'll never come back. But there was not one Christian that died when Titus came and he destroyed Jerusalem because they had followed the words of Christ. And so the Lord is going to protect us. And the Bible says, when you see all these things begin to come upon you, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because your redemption draweth nigh. Hallelujah. I believe this is the year of rejoicing. This is the year of victory in the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to share with you four things that I want you to do this year. I want you to write them down. If you don't uh, have any paper, write them down on your arm. Everybody else tattoos themselves. Why don't you tattoo yourself with the word of God? Hallelujah. Number one, I want you to declare every day, this is a day of victory. This is a day that we will win this day. Say it with me. We will win this day. <coughs> I want you to get up in the morning. I want you to prophesy to yourself, this is a day of victory. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry what's going to happen next week. Just give me this day our daily bread. And Jesus will bring you through victorious in the name of the Lord. I got up this morning. I began to prophesy to myself. 
I had an angel come and wake me up at 3.33. I was so tired. I said, God, can I, I, I don't think I can get up. And I got up and went in there and prayed and the glory of God came on me. I still feel it in my bones right now. Hallelujah. And the Lord began to speak to me. God began to talk to me this morning. I finally went back to bed about 30 minutes later. And I tell you, in the name of Jesus, I began to declare that today was a day God had declared for me. This is my day. I'm gonna be victorious today. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know I've got the devil by his tail right now, and I'm squeezing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So declare victory and win your day. The second thing that you must believe God is that God's gonna bless you. You're gonna prosper. I don't care what happens to the economy. God's gonna give you direction in the name of Jesus. In the times of Joseph, Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh. He said, you're gonna have seven good years and seven bad years. He said, save during the good times and uh, you will prosper during the bad times. And they prospered during those seven good years. But when the bad years came, they prospered even greater. Do you believe God can cause you to be blessed greater when the economy's down than when it's up in the name of the Lord? I believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you and direct you and guide you. I was fasting and the Lord spoke to me on, on these, this early year fast as we do and God told me to sell a piece of rental property I had. It was the most prosperous property that I owned. I made more money off that property than any other property I had. And God said to sell it. I said, I don't wanna sell that property. It's a, it's a blessing to me. And the Lord said, you sell it. And so I put it up for sale and a buyer came and bought that property. And then right after that, things totally changed in that area. And that property values began to drop and drop and drop. But God has spoken to me and I came out blessed in the name of Jesus. God can bless you even in a down time. When the bad times came, Joseph began to buy property and they absolutely began to increase and increase and increase. Years ago, I was invited to come to Bismarck, North Dakota, and there a pastor who lived down in Lemon, South Dakota, met me, and he drove me that two-hour stretch. That's where the Sioux Indian Nation is. That's where Sitting Bull was killed. I met the chief. The chief was was the great, great grandson of the brother to Setting Bull, and his claim to fame was that brother that he had killed uh, Custer. And he had become a Christian, this great, great grandson. And uh, uh, so it had not rained there for three years. And they had read my book on the 21 day fast, and they said, Pastor Bob, do you believe if we fasted that it would rain here in Lemon. They took me out and showed me the, reser the a reservoir, the water reservoir. It was a lake, it was a small lake. It had a dam that had been built and you could actually see the foundation of the dam. The water level was so low, it looked like a pond at a farmer that would be dried up. That's what it looked like. They said, if it doesn't rain this year, our town's gonna to close up. There's gonna be bankruptcies in this whole part of South Dakota. What should we do? I said, well, I think you ought to get every church together, the leadership, and call a day of fasting. And on that, fast at least until the evening time. Have a service and repent of your sins. Ask God to heal your land. And so that night, it sprinkled, it, it rained. And the next morning I met with them again. I said, that's a sign to you that God is going to heal South Dakota. So what happened was uh, they called a national or, or a day of prayer. The Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist, the Church of God, the Sioux Indians, they came together and they prayed. Three weeks later, it began to rain. And it rained and it rained and it rained. It rained for a week. It filled up the the reservoir. The reservoir was at the very top level. Some had said they had never seen it filled that high before. They sent me a newspaper towards August 
and they had had the largest crop that any people had remembered. They had the silos totally filled with grain, with wheat. And then there were piles of, of, of the wheat that went almost as high as the top of those silos. What was it? It was God blessed them and God healed their land and God will bless you even in a time of famine for the glory of God. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. And then I want you to believe God for revival to come. Say revival in my family. The Bible says, and it will come to pass afterwards that I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will... For your best gift to the ministry, Dr. Rogers would like to help you in your time of fasting and prayer with his best-selling book, America, Fasting for Revival, and the all-new Prayer Force Report. Plus, call now with your best gift. We will include the 21-Day Fast Journal. These ministry materials are available now from Bob Rogers Ministries when you call 1-888-613-6080 or visit bobrogersministries.org. Experience the worship, be changed by the ministry, and feel the presence of God. Don't miss any of the special fasting services at Evangel this January. For more information, visit worldprayercenter.org or like us on Facebook. Be a part of the 2015 fasting movement with Dr. Bob Rogers. Visit my21dayfast.com for updates, fasting materials, and other resources. My21dayfast.com is your source for information on fasting and prayer in 2015.